Hi everybody, my name's Ostap, and I'm one of the middle school youth pastors here at CLCC. We're so excited that you could be joining us today, and if this is your first time, we'd love to get connected with you. There's a connect button on our website at clcc.ca located near the top of the homepage. If you wanna click that, fill out a form, we'll be sure to get connected with you and get you connected into the CLCC church family. Also, if you like what you hear this morning, hit that like button and leave us a comment. We really wanna know that you're enjoying what you're hearing. Today, Pastor Troy will be sharing the message with us, but before we get into that, let's get together and sing some songs in worship.
Well, thank you so much for joining us this weekend. Across all of our campuses, uh, even online, once a month, we pause our services and we, we take communion together. So no matter where you are, I trust that you have bread or juice close by that, that you can participate in communion together. So uh, we always read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, and this is what Paul writes. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I encourage you right now just to take that bread and remember that that was the body broken for you. Verse 25 says, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Maybe just take a moment now. Thank God for the blood that was broke, that was shed for you. And take that juice. Verse 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me pray for you today. So Father, we are so grateful for the gift that you gave us, your one and only son, to come to this earth to die an, 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 an unimaginable death for us. Broken body, spilt blood for, for, for us. So God, today as we pause, as we remember, help us to remember that amazing sacrifice, that very loving sacrifice, that grace-filled sacrifice that you gave us. So God, we thank you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. VBS is starting this week, so please be praying for our volunteers and staff for strength and wisdom as they lead. Also be praying for the children who attend that they would experience the love of Jesus this week. CLCC is such a generous church, and I'm so grateful to be a part of this church family and community. Your generosity is helping spread the love of Jesus, as well as meeting the tangible needs of the people in this community and other communities. When you give to God, it expresses your love for Him, and you can give here or you can give online at clcc.ca slash give. Now let's jump into Pastor Troy's sermon today. In every culture, throughout all ages, all kids have made a statement, and it's usually said with a whine. They say, that's not fair, to which all parents in all generations and cultures at all times have said in return, life's not fair. 
I remember as a kid getting to eat the extra dessert, but I often had to share. There might have only been one piece left and I might be splitting it with one of my siblings. Someone would cut it in half and you would inspire it to see what piece was the biggest because you always wanted the biggest piece. And if someone else got the bigger piece, that wouldn't have been fair. Anyone else grow up like that? Any parent have to deal with that? There's something inside of us where we want life to be fair. And there's, there's this repeated lie out there that life should be fair, but we, we really only want it fair some of the time. Because when you think about it, you're only concerned about fairness when you get the short end of the stick. We're not too concerned about fairness when, when you were the one who caused the problem and someone else had to help out, you know, or, or, or maybe you applied for a job that others have applied for and you've been praying for it. You ask your friends to pray for it and, and you get it. You get this job. You know what you don't say? You don't say, life's so unfair. You say, God answered my prayer. You don't ask, why is life so unfair for those three or four other people who didn't get the job? But there's someone else in the city, maybe a lot of someone else's, and they're saying, I can't believe that life is so unfair. We often think that life should be fair, but it never is. This is a lie that we've heard so many times that some of us believe. And I guess when we say that life should be fair, we're saying that life should be even. But life isn't even, is it? There's no way for things to be even. There is always going to be someone who gets the job and someone who applied for it and really wanted it and didn't get it. Today, we're going to address the, the, the lie that life should be fair because that's a lie that a lot of people believe. But the fact is that life isn't fair. It isn't even. A big, broad question is, how much have we bought into this lie? Because in a minute, we're going to see that Jesus will show us that that the question or issue isn't how to make it fair or even, but what are you going to do with the hand that you've been dealt with? What are you going to do with the slice that God has given you? Now, this idea of life not being fair isn't new. All, All this stuff that I just said, Jesus actually taught 2,000 years ago. And today we'll be in Matthew chapter 25. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there now. Now, what we're about to read is a parable. And now when Jesus taught in parables, they were stories to make a point. Now in this section of Matthew, there's a series of parables of what the kingdom of God is like. The, the, The kingdom of God is about how God views the world that he wants us to live in. Now this kingdom is invisible, so sometimes it's hard to explain. So, so Jesus tells stories to try and explain it. This is a story, a parable of God's perspective of the unevenness or unfairness of life. Now, if you grew up in church, you may have heard this as the story of the parable of talents, but it's not the kind of talents that you might think. It's not being able to sing and dance or be able to rub your stomach and pat your head at the same time. In this story, a talent was a measure of money. Now, to the original audience, it would have been a very cultural story. This story is about to teach us a lesson about the unevenness of life. Now, just a reminder about parables. When Jesus would teach parables, he would tell them to make one point. Now, Jesus would also speak in extreme sometimes just to make that point. So as we read this story, some of you might be thinking, hey, that would never happen. Well, it didn't happen. It's just a a story. Now, I'm sure I'm sure that none of you walked out of your favorite Marvel movie because you found it too unrealistic. You often have to suspend reality to watch a movie. Sometimes Jesus talks in extremes just to make a point. And there, there might be some details of this story that when you really look at it, you might say, hey, that's not fair. But that's the point of the story. Jesus is using story to make a point. In this case, about the kingdom of God and to combat the lie that life is fair. Jesus is about to tell us that life, it's not fair. Now, let me, let me tell you the end just in case you fall asleep. In the end, God doesn't try and fix the unevenness or unfairness of life. 
God wants us to leverage it, use it to help other people, help other people's needs be met and help other people to get ahead. So let's pick up this teaching of Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. Again, now, uh, again is a reference uh, to the string of stories about the kingdom of God. Uh, Again, it will be like a man going out on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. This guy gave his servants his wealth. He gave them money or entrusted it to them. This master split up his wealth with three of his servants to do with his wealth what he would do, not to protect or guard it, but to invest, manage his money. This would be like a money manager today. Now, just to be clear, he's expecting these guys to do what he do with his money, not just protect it. Now, verse 15 says, To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags of gold, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Now, in this culture, a bag of gold was worth about 20 years of work. Five bags of gold would be 100 years of work. We're, We're talking a lot of money, probably millions of dollars today. The master divided the bags up, and and in the passage, he says, each according to his ability. Now, some of you might be saying, why not evenly? Well, that's not fair. And Jesus would say, well, that's the point. And if you think that's offensive, just wait. It might get worse for you. Verse 16, the man who'd received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also, the one with two bags gained two more. Now, These two servants put their master's money to work immediately and doubled their master's investment. They were really good at what they did. They do, they do with it what what they think their master would do with it. They both know what the master expects of them. Verse 18. But the man who received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and buried the master's money. This is interesting behavior. No one would dig a hole and put money in the ground. E- even, if, even if you're wanting to keep it safe, n- no one should or would do this. Sometimes I wonder, what's going, what's going on in the mind of the guy who, th- who got the least amount? Maybe, maybe he was ticked because he wasn't treated fairly. Maybe he believed a lie that life should be fair. And man, he's trying to make a point to his master. You know, but of course, we can't get into his mind because he never existed. This is a story. Now, here are a few things that I've already noticed and would like to point out about the first part of the story. First thing is, everyone is given opportunity. Now, your opportunity might not look like your neighbor's, but opportunity comes for everyone. Everyone has something. It can be an idea or a thought or a talent that you have. Maybe you can do something that the average person has a tough time doing. You know what? That, that ability came from the master. Those gifts are there to be used, invested. No matter wh- whether you have five, whether you have two or one bag, everyone is given something. The second thing I noticed is that what we have is on loan to us from the master. Whatever these servants have, it's not theirs. It's the master's. And one day, the master's going to ask for an account of what they did with it. So let's take a look at the second half of this story. In verse 19, it says, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. After a long time, they, they might not even have wondered. They may have wondered, is this guy ever going to come back? But after a long time, he came back to settle accounts with them. That meant that they weren't just to bring back the gold and say, hey, I protected it. He wanted a return. He wanted to see what they did with his gold. Verse 20, the man who'd received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Some of you 
might be thinking, hey, master, you said the same thing to the person who gained you five and two more bags of gold, and that's not fair. (laughs) Now, at this point of the story, it's time for the guy with one bag of gold to give his report. And we see a great example of first century whining. And now maybe if this were a a movie, you might hear the background music change. You might know that something bad was coming. Verse 24, then the man who'd received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Picture this. He's standing there with probably dirt under his fingernails. And did you notice he kind of blames the master? It's almost like he's saying, it, it's, it's sort of your fault. You're a hard man. Life has been good to you. I did this because it's the way you are. So I hid your gold. Verse 26, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. He's saying, you didn't bury it because of me. You buried it because you're lazy. You didn't think this through. You took the easy way out. You want to blame me and make excuses? I gave you something and you did nothing with it. If you knew me, you should have come up with a better plan. He continues, well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. You know, I think after the description of this master, I think that the master would have been happier if this guy came back and said he tried something, but he's lost it all. At least, at least then he could prove that he was trying, but he didn't even try. And And here's a surprise verse. In verse 28, this is when it gets really unfair. This is what the master says. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. Some of you might say, hey, that's not fair. What about the guy with four? How about divide it in half and give half to each? And Jesus would respond with, this is a story, a parable. It really didn't happen. But don't forget that life's not fair. At this point of the story, Don't don't believe the lie that life should be fair. Everyone gets an uneven amount of opportunity, but everyone is held accountable with what what they have to do with it. You're going to be held accountable with what you have. Everyone has responsibility and everyone someday will have to give an account with the uneven amount that they have done, what they've done with their opportunity. We all need to leverage what you have. Don't worry about what you don't have. Listen, we are not responsible for what God has given to other people. We are just responsible for what we have been, what we have been given ourselves. So after this story, I think that everyone falls into one of these categories, these three categories. There are some people who have five bags of opportunity. There are other people who have two bags of opportunity. And there are some people with one bag. You know, There's the five bag people. They were born in the right families and everything comes natural to them. They married right. They are good looking. They're good looking without makeup. And you secretly hate them. (laughs) They're good at everything. And some of them get reality TV shows. (laughs) But for those of these people, some of these people, they just don't do reality TV. They actually do something with their talent They've been entrusted with a lot and they do something about it. They do something with their influence. They do something with what God has given them. Then there's the one bag people. Life is tough. They don't have a lot going from themselves. And if you find yourself in this category compared to these other people, these five bag people, you think, I don't have a lot going for me. I don't have the influence that they do. Because these, these people... They may have grown up in the wrong family. They, they didn't get into the right schools and maybe, maybe they were abused or neglected. You know, I've run across a few of these people in my life. And I remember in one of the churches that I was a youth pastor, having this teenager and she looked like she had everything together. She was, she was always at youth. She was on the honor roll and man, was she ever responsible. But I remember the surprise as I found out about her story. 
thinking about how, how, how her family, th- thinking about what, what was going on in her family, thinking about how did this happen? How did she happen? We found out that her mom had a mental illness. Her dad was abusive and was in and out of different jails. You never think that this well put together high schooler came from that home. She's one of the smartest people in the youth ministry. Now, she eventually ended up getting a full scholarship to one of the best medical schools in the country. She, she became a medical doctor. She didn't use growing up in a one-bag family as an excuse for giving up. And she had an excuse, didn't she? She had this built-in excuse to live the same way her mom did. Her mindset could have been, uh, why should I even try? I've only got one bag of gold. I'm not like these other rich church kids who seem to have everything handed to them on a silver platter. You know what? These one bag people, they make the best stories because they make a decision to stop making excuses, to stop believing in the lie that life should be fair. You don't watch movies about people who make excuses and live life all about them. You know, and then... Then there's the rest of us, somewhere in the middle. We may, not, we may say that life's not fair. You know, the one big people, they have really cool stories. The five big people, they have really cool stuff. I'm right in the middle. I, I, I'm, I'm a two big person. I'm born in the middle class in an average size home with average looking people. I don't have the cool stories. I don't have all the money or influence. And you might be tempted just to make excuses with your situation. What, what am I going to do? This is what you should do. Look at what you've been given and leverage it. Use it, invest it for all it's worth for something bigger than yourself. Don't believe the lie that life is fair. Use the opportunity that you have and invest that opportunity. If you call yourself a Christian, do it for the sake of God's kingdom. If you're not a Christian, find something that you can invest your life in that's bigger than you because living for yourself is too small of a goal for you to waste your entire life on. You don't read stories about people who waste their life on themselves or just make excuses. The question is, what are, what are we going to do with what we have? You know, look at it. Look at what you have and leverage it, invest it, use it to help others. Here's the bottom line. God isn't trying to be fair. He wants to make you responsible for with what you have. Are you going to complain with what you don't have? Or are you going to take what you have and, and use it for the benefit of the master? God gave it to you. And even if it's one peg, don't forget, it's gold. It's valuable. It came from the master. What are you going to do with it? Maybe today you're 22 years old and you have an okay job. What opportunities do you have? How can you invest your life? You don't know what your future has in store for you. What are you going to do with that? Maybe you're 32 years old and you wish you were married or maybe at least dating. What are you going to invest your life in, your time in? How are you going to make, how are you, going to, how are you making yourself the person that you want to marry, want to marry you? Take that bag of gold and use it for all it's worth. Maybe you're in your mid-30s. You're a single mom. You're working two jobs just to feed your kids. How are you investing in your kids? What messages are you planting in their lives? Take that opportunity and use it for all it's worth. Maybe you're 45 and your business has been way more successful than you ever have imagined. You find that you have more money than you ever thought you ever have. Don't just buy houses around the world for vacation, but leverage this wealth for the kingdom of God. Don't just build your kingdom, but figure out ways to double your master's wealth. Use your influence. Because really, the stuff that you have really isn't yours to begin with, is is it? God has entrusted this wealth to you. And we need to understand the extra that I have is an opportunity. So how can I invest it to help other people? So are you going to look at your situation and complain about what you don't have? Or are you going to look at at what the master or, or what your heavenly father has given you and invest it for all that it's worth? Let me pray for you. Father, 
so grateful for this story, this great example that you have given every single one of us something. No matter who we are, God, we have a talent, we have an ability that we can use for you. God, I pray for the Christians, the people who call themselves Christians, that we would figure out ways to take what you have given us and invest it into the kingdom of God to see our talent double. So God, thank you for the opportunities in front of us. God, I pray that you would, we would continue to look what it means, think about what it means to be faithful. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, now is the question of the day. This is a time for you to discuss what we've talked about. You can talk about it with the people that you're watching with, or maybe you're watching it on your own. Just take a moment and to think about this question. And here's your question. In what areas of your life are you not taking full responsibility of that, that's been entrusted to you? Take a moment now, talk about that. The most important and interesting verse is verse 19. It says, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. It's almost scary. You, you get to give an account with your life. It, now, it might be an opportunity for you to make excuses, but what excuse are you going to give to God? Are you going to continue to repeat the lies that you've believed your entire life? We all have time. We all have an uneven amount of time. We all have opportunities, but we all have an uneven amount of opportunities. Are you going to be an individual who makes the decision to make the most of every opportunity that comes your way? Are you going to make the decision not to take these opportunities for granted and make the decision not to make excuses? Luke chapter 12, verse 48 says this, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. When we embrace that thought, that there's a God who loves us, is cheering for us, empowers us, and has given us the power to be responsible, man, we should be encouraged to not make excuses, but to use opportunities to make God's kingdom expand. If, if we think that, we are well ahead. My heart's desire and my prayer for you is that we become a generation of Christians who get this right. Romans chapter 11, verse 33 and 36 says this, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Thanks for tuning in today. Hopefully you have a fantastic week. Thank you for tuning in for today's service. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions, we would love to hear from you and help you get connected here. We are one church in multiple locations. Our Alder Grove campus meets at Alder Grove Community Secondary School every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. And our Abbotsford campus has three services each Sunday, 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. We would love to see you at one of our gatherings. Stay in touch through the week. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Search CLCC Church to find us. We hope this service gave you a glimpse into our community. We'd love for you to be a part of it, and we hope to see you next week.